Hi, I am thrilled to be participating in the Ada Lovelace celebration, and it's exciting to hear that this is the second year um, Bangladesh is celebrating the role of uh, women in, in technology. So I want to um, start by giving a little bit of background of uh, about who I am. Um, I'm originally from Bangladesh. I grew up in Bangladesh, um, but for the last um, more than 25 years, I've been uh, living in the United States. So, um, let's see if this works. Um, so a bit of background um, to start with. I grew up in, in Dhaka, in Bangladesh. I was born and brought up in Dhaka. Then um, initially I attended an English medium school called Maple Leaf till third grade. And after that, I, I was in the Garnisa school till my SSD, which I took um, now decades ago in 1990 and then did my HSC. After that, um, unlike many during my time, I came to the United States for my undergraduate studies, and I graduated in electrical engineering from the University of Rochester. But my dream always was to uh, go to MIT. And although initially coming from Bangladesh, I never thought I would get in or I should even apply. Uh, when, when I got to Rochester, I had the courage and, and successfully made it. And I, was there for my master's and PhD, and I finished my PhD in 2003. At the same year, I, I got married um, uh, to, to uh, my husband, who is also an academic. Um, he is not from Bangladesh and um, has been one of the best decisions of my life and, and has played a significant role in in my career growth and my career trajectory. And um, actually today on the January 28th is the 18th hour, 18th wedding anniversary. And one of the reasons I'm not giving this talk live, otherwise I would have been uh, thrilled to, to be able to talk to you live. Um, and beyond that, in my kind of major life events, I had, I am blessed with two beautiful sons um, who were born in 2012 and 2016. As you can see, um, I think for Bangladeshi standards, I um, married quite late as well as I had kids quite late, late in my life. Here are some significant moments of my life. Um, here I am with my uh, mom at a young age in front of my um, grandmother's house. Um, I, as I mentioned, I came to the United States um, in 1993, and I was at that point actually one of two girls in the class of 35 um, students graduating in electrical engineering. Um, and the, the sad reality is that the, that's kind of hovering around 5% of women in electrical engineering. And right now I'm on the advisory uh, committee of um, University of Rochester's electrical engineering department, and the numbers haven't changed. And um, one of my favorite pictures is the picture of my dad um, hugging me right after uh, during my PhD wedding ceremony. And um, the the pride and love that is in his eyes has always been there for me, and has been a major factor of what. Um, why I've been able to pursue some of my dreams and actually come to the United States in the first place and, and, and really um, go against the kind of norm of what uh, was expected of, of girls when I was growing up and also parents letting their um, kids come abroad, particularly girls um, and living alone by themselves. So I'm especially grateful for my um, dad who has enabled um, pretty much everything in my life. Um, and, and there's my husband who also has been a rock in my life and us um, in the bottom left you see us uh, on our wedding day um, who is to this date um, has been always there in, and my biggest, uh, biggest champion. I wanna move on to talk a little bit about 
about my professional background. Uh, as I said, after, after I finished my PhD um, at MIT, I first started as a researcher at Intel, and I was there for about four years. And I've always was very interested in innovation and actually driving and leading Asia. Um, so I wanted to uh, pursue academia and particularly create my own research group and, and be a faculty. I started my academic career at Dartmouth College in, in New Hampshire, where I was part of uh, the computer science faculty as an assistant professor from 2008 to 2011, at which point um, I uh, moved to Cornell University in upstate New York in Ithaca, um, and I was part of the computer science and information science faculty. Um, I am currently at the New York City campus uh, called Cornell Tech. Uh, so I've been in Cornell since 2011, um, and those who are in in academia, um, tenure is a big thing. I, I got my tenure in 2014. Uh, in uh, 2019, I was promoted to full professor. And um, just last year, um, I was lucky to have an endowed professorship. And I have um, an endowed chair right now in integrated health and technology. While um, I wanted to pursue academia, I was always very passionate about uh, taking research out into the real world and, and try at least my own small way to make a meaningful impact in society. And in 2015, about five years ago, um, I was one of the co-founder of a mental health tech startup called Health Rhythms. Um, I served as the CEO for five years and um, currently, the, the company is still small. It's, it's grown to 15 employees, but um, we have um, built products successfully, um, licensed our product, and raised about more than $7 billion in funding to grow the company. And here are some highlights of my uh, professional career. I've, I've had the opportunity when our department opened to uh, talk about my research and demo my research to uh, Bill Gates. I had the uh, opportunity to present the research that I'm doing um, in the US Senate. Uh, one of the on the top left uh, corner that you see this huge check. Uh, we, our team won um, a health uh, tech competition that awarded us $100,000. That was the first um, seed money that went into founding the company Health Rhythms. And uh, without that uh, the initial um, challenge that we won, um, it would have been hard to establish um, the company. And the, the biggest highlight of, of my kind of professional career, as you see the left, bottom left, is always my students. I've been blessed by having brilliant students who have um, worked relentlessly and really helped um, helped um, kind of push forward some of the research ideas and that we have come up with together and and uh, we've been able to successfully uh, publish innovate as well as take some of these technology out into the real world so that that gives you a bit of a background of who I am, uh, my trajectory, both uh, in my life, um, personally, as well as professionally. Now I wanna uh, talk a little bit about kind of my inspirations and obstacles, uh, because I hope this you, you're finding many inspirational talk, activities, opportunities to connect and, um, over, over the course of my career, some of the inspirations um, have really taken me um, further than I thought I would be able to go and, and some of the obstacles that I had to consciously overcome. So I wanna start with um, being in Bangladesh and, and growing up in the, in the um, 80s and 90s as a, as a young, Women, um, there were a lot of uh, um, expectations and, and norms that um, 
who I had to I had to um, abide by or or at least uh, pretend to abide uh, abide by and and that leads to me kind of talking about the weight of cultural norms um, culture is a very important part of, of who we are and some of these uh, norms kind of root us ground us give us give us comfort um, but it, it it can also weigh us down and um, one of my most striking uh, kind of memories of when I was when I was in high school uh, I think preparing for the SSC examination uh, at that point everybody had a tutor and I had um, a tutor who was supposed to be very um, famous and, and tutored all the students who did well in, in Bengali. And after, at the end, uh, when I was um, just before the SSC examination, when we were done with the, the tutoring sessions, he gave all his students um, a book. And I actually don't remember what book I got, but I do remember um, what he wrote inside. Um, he said, um, it seems like a great um, uh, great statement, um, but those uh, many of you are probably also can detect some of the, the sarcasm and in some ways um, uh, a somewhat of a passive aggressive insult that was um, embedded in there when I when I showed this to uh, my mom, she said, what did you do? Um, and it was a thought that I was, I was too argumentative, I wasn't respectful. And, and, and that is something growing up that was consistent for me as um, there was always the expectation that being Respectful means that you cannot argue or you cannot disagree. Uh, being respectful means that you always listen to the opinions of those who came before you. Um, and that was even more so for, for women who were supposed to be soft-spoken and, and really kind of arguing was seen as almost um, not graceful. And that, that that I think is something that can be very damaging um, because being able to think critically, being able to argue respectfully and being able to express someone's opinion and convince others about your ideas and your opinion is hugely important. And I think um, as, we, as we take solace in our culture, we also have to pay attention to um, some of the baggage that comes with it and, and take pride in being able to express ourselves and find ourselves and, and be true to our identity. Which brings to me to the second uh, point that I want to make, um, that identity does not mean conformity. And when I was uh, growing up, and especially when I was um, just before I was coming to the United States, uh, a lot of friends and relatives of my parents would say, you're going to send your girl to the US and she's going to stay in a dorm and she's going to be all by herself. She's going to lose her identity. Um, she's too young. She, she's just going to lose her identity. When I came to MIT, um, that is where I met my current husband now. Um, uh, he, because he wasn't from Bangladesh, um, uh, some of the comments that I would also get from some of the Bangladeshi community around was that, um, that I would lose my identity and my, my grounding. And I wanna kind of say that um, sometimes we confuse our own identity with the, the group conformity. And um, sometimes that pressure to conform to the group really uh, puts a damper on discovering ourselves and who we are. Our identity is first to be true to ourselves. And if we can understand ourselves and discover who we are and, and what makes us tick, there 
that is that is the key to to being kind of successful and happy both in our personal lives and and in our professional lives so one of the things that um I've really um, carried throughout throughout my kind of personal life and um, academic life is really try to understand who I am and what I value and what I want and what makes me happy. And if it doesn't conform to to the norms of the the community I grew up and that I'm part of, that is okay, as long as um, I'm being respectful to others and I'm not imposing my views and my uh, expectation on, on others. So the so that's, that's the point I wanna make that it is so important to discover oneself because without that, we can't really truly, I feel like reach our fullest, uh, fullest potential. But we are not in our uh, on our own, and and role models matter, and the support that we get matter. And uh, for me, some of my role models to start with, um, I already mentioned my my father was in gave me the freedom. He would let us argue as long as it was respectful and he would hear us out. Um, another role model was also my mom who was um, uh, a professional woman and she was the first um, uh, woman uh, to reach the rank of a secretary in, in the Bangladesh government. Um, she was professionally successful. She, knew, uh, she worked with the United Nations as part of Bangladesh government. Um, she used to travel abroad extensively. And that's when I saw that not only um, that my mom was ambitious and um, she tried to um, reach higher, but also the support that she got from my uh, father, who well, when all my mom's friends um, were expected to, to be there for their husbands and not think about their career, what they want to achieve in life, but um, support their families and their husbands, my, um, my father full fledged they supported my mom and not only did she support he had so much pride he would talk about my mom's career to us to his friends and that pride and support went a long way in in shaping us and also what we um, our family so I've, I've i've learned the how valuable it is not only to have role models um but also um having uh, your loved ones support you in your journey of discovering who you are and what you want to be, and and that has that has played out for me greatly in the support I get from my husband. When I when I was my uh, doing my undergraduate at that point, I was um, um, going out with someone from Bangladesh um, and who who also was academically successful, came from um, a progressive family, but there is a difference between talking progressive and being progressive. And I, I felt, uh, at least um, when I was growing up, there were, there were peer men who talked progressive, but really um, wouldn't feel comfortable to having, having a partnership who might be equally successful or even more successful than. Um, so a lot of lot of problems occurred when I had graduated, and I actually uh, graduated with um, stronger results than um, he did. And then I got into MIT, and um, then we we broke up because um, he felt that if I if I truly believed in that relationship, I wouldn't go to MIT and be there with him. But um, I think ultimately I was fortunate to find my find my husband who has again just like my father has been my biggest champion. He has supported in my all my career moves. He often has even sacrificed his career um, goals sometimes to support support me. And he to this day is 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 the rock and and who I who I turn to for um, courage and and and. Um, strength in, in pursuing, 
pursuing my dreams. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about my work and, and what I do for my kind of research. I, um, as I said, I'm a professor at Cornell Tech and my group is called People Aware Computing. And, and the work we do is we build um, technological solutions um, for understanding people better and a big application area is in health, health technology. And um, we work in mobile and ubiquitous computing that combines machine learning to build systems that can be used in, in healthcare. A big focus area that we work on and my group works on is in mental and behavioral health, which I think is an important topic worldwide. I'll, I'll give you um, uh, some example of what it looks like in the US. Um, and I know that their mental health is a big problem in Bangladesh as well. Um, it's really uh, the biggest problem for uh, behavioral health and mental health is that you can't fix what you can't measure. And behavioral health to this date uh, remains very difficult to, to measure. And in, in the United States alone, uh, there are about more than 50 million people who suffer from um, depression or some uh, mental illness. Uh, there are greater than 50% um, are undiagnosed and it costs billions of dollars in treatment. But how we live our lives provide a lot of indication of how someone's mental health is progressing. Um, there are, these are quotes from from patients who are, or, and sometimes their loved ones who are talking about what changes they see in someone's behavior. Um, I didn't want to wake up. I was having a much better time to sleep or I had barely any social contacts. My legs bounce, speech goes fast. I even eat too fast. My wife can tell by my walk. These signals we can start picking up using the devices that we carry. We already know we can get activity data, sleep data. And then what we can do is put these signals together into understanding people's social behavior, physical behavior, sleep behavior, how their biological clock works, how, um, psychomotor, that means a house, uh, are they slowing down, are they speeding up? And that could be used um, to look at patients' trajectories and, and uh, get an assessment of, of people's mental health. And some of the work that we've been doing recently is thinking about can we build a system that can predict major psychiatric events so that we can give care to people before they end up in a hospital or emergency room. And the biggest challenge is not only that there is the measurement is poor, people express their symptoms in different ways. And when we build an AI system, it has to be robust. And um, uh, the other technical challenge is that um, when we're building these AI models, we must be able to interpret what's going on because we can't just give a classification of, of someone's depressed. We need to know why the system thinks they're depressed so that the clinician um, addressing the problem can, can also get some insight into the behavior. So we've done some work in using deep neural networks um, to look at people's healthy behavior and try to um, reproduce it. And by looking at the changes between the kind of reproduced behavior from the healthy data that we see and the difference in their behavior is indicative of whether someone is uh, might relapse or have a, a major psychiatric episode. So here in the x-axis, the zero is when someone has a relapse event. In this case, the patient was hospital, patients were hospitalized. And um, on the y-axis, we show how um, anomalous were their behavior is by based on the error between the recreated behavior and the, and the actual behavior that we observe. And you can see that the um, anomaly rate goes up. So just by capturing continuously data that we can um, collect using your smartphone and um, looking at the trends over time, now we can start looking at um, someone's mental health changes and mental health decline. In our case, we saw kind of almost um, the behavior like anomaly rates uh, doubling um, before, almost a month before someone had a, a major psychiatric episode. Some of the other work that we are doing is also having tighter synchronization between um, the uh, kind of sensing and measurement that we can 
do and the intervention that we can provide. And I'll give you one example of something that we are doing that trying to do is that goes beyond just looking at apps that gives you messages or deliver um, suggestions or, or um, meditation apps and, and, and um, mindfulness to kind of thinking that how can we leverage the technology just like how we can now measure things almost invisibly using the devices around us. Um, can we leverage this technology to deliver intervention almost invisibly? And um, there's our, uh, there is uh, a concept of biofeedback that often is used effectively in mental health intervention. And what we try to do is deliver that kind of intervention using smart watches. So here, if someone is getting anxious, let's say their heart's beating faster, you can use uh, a smart watch to kind of vibrate and give very subtly give a feedback about their heart rate. Now, instead of giving them the real heart rate feedback, if you slowed it down, will that have a calming effect? And we saw that it did by actually uh, measuring their heart rate and, and, and kind of tweaking the feedback in a very subtle way. We can give real-time feedback that can reduce the person's anxiety level. And we also see a physiological change in terms of actually changing their heart rate and heart rate variability. Some other work that we are doing um, with mental health is mental health and and sometimes substance use or substance abuse come um, hand in hand. People often, uh, those who are getting uh, depressed often consume alcohol or drugs um, to as a first um, line of treatment of self-medication. So some of the work that we are doing is extending um, uh, data using wearables and what new types of sensing we can put to um, get more data about um, substance use. We are, we are doing um, some sensing to measure uh, alcohol consumption. We also are looking at physiological changes uh, that happen with um, drug use. One, uh, one of the signals is goosebumps, so uh, particularly associated with opioid overdose. So can future generation smartwatches um, actually have the ability to track consumption of substance use and even anticipate whether someone is craving so that uh, we can provide better, better intervention. So with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity for giving uh, um, giving me kind of the, the 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 pleasure to present to you today, and I want to end by by just summarizing some of the things that I mentioned. Be argumentative. It's um, there is no shame to be in being argumentative. There is nothing wrong. Uh, to be able to articulate your point and make a point um, effectively is good, uh, but be respectful. Um, discover your identity before you try to conform to the identity of the group or the expectation of society. Uh, without understanding who you are and what you want, it's really hard to achieve um, your best professionally and personally. And Choose your partner carefully. I know many um, successful women and, um, and say that having um, a supportive um, real partner is very important. And I think um, that has been very true in my life. And as, as if you're able to do that, you are well prepared to take risks in your career um, and oftentimes with high risks comes high reward, but also comes failure but you will be mentally prepared to learn from your failures. And, and, and really, um, you can do, um, by which I mean that you, you will have the can-do attitudes and the grit to learn from your failures, take risk, and ultimately um, be a pioneer and innovator um, like Ada Lovelace. I'm sure that there are many of you, many budding Ada Lovelaces are out there. And I, I, I really um, hope to see uh, many more women coming from Bangladesh. And um, although I've had the pleasure of also um, supervising the PhD of some very successful students um, from Bangladesh, I would love to see more uh, who are uh, really breaking glass ceilings and pushing their career uh, to their 
fullest potential. So thank you again. Um, if I would love to hear from you and if you have questions, you can feel free to reach out to me by email. Um, you can, if you Google me, you'll find my contact information and thank you again.